Hey, everybody. Welcome to the first webinar of 2017. I am so incredibly excited to jump into what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, just to make sure that everybody can hear me, I'm in a new location, so I want to make sure that everything's okay, that I'm not too echoey. Can you make sure that type in the chat bar, yes, you can hear me, uh, to make sure that I am coming through loud and clear. Hello from Milwaukee. Cool. Awesome. Very cool. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Hey, Art. <laughs> Good to see everybody on this call. I just, I wasn't planning on doing this. I'm sure you guys got a bunch of emails from me. It was really last minute. And I know I was flooding your inbox uh, because it just got to a point where I was, I had so many things that were coming up. It was a brand new year. And I was like, you know what? This is something that I really am so like exploding with excitement to be able to share with you guys. I was in a conversation with one of the HR managers we're working with, and she was just picking my brain about challenges that she's been having and, and, and questions. And, and she had so many questions that I knew that they were probably questions that you were going to have as well. So I said, hey, you know what? Uh, and she's on this call right now, actually. I was like, let's get on a webinar, because why not share what I'm going to share with her with all of you as well? So I always like to start off this webcast with, uh, with some ground rules of things that we're going to cover. Uh, first and foremost, this is all about a conversation. This is all about you. So I want to make sure that you are getting in all of the questions and comments that you need. So I'm going to be monitoring as we're talking the chat bar. So if you have any questions, concerns, uh, comments, please feel free as we're having uh, having a discussion here to be able to insert it in. And I'd love to be able to answer questions as we go along because I've found I get the most out of it when I'm making sure that things are relevant to you. You're, of course, going to as well. Second, I'm going to talk today about something I've actually never talked about. I've never told anybody. They're more like trade secrets than anything else. And, and a lot of that has really come from uh, just a revelation that I had, you know, at the end of the year, you reflect on your year, you look at what, you know, the new year is going to bring. And I'm not really into resolutions, but I am into vision casting. And every year I pick a word and that word I really focus on. And 2016 was my year for the word actualize. And it was really this word that was focused on how do you turn ideas into action. I've seen it in my personal life, uh, and I've seen it in my professional life, and I've seen it in the lives of my clients as well, where we're not just talking about theory, we're talking about actually doing it. So the more that we get to hang out, the more that we get to know each other, you'll learn that really quickly about me, that I'm not really into theory. Theory is great as a discussion point at a cocktail party, but I actually want to know the five steps of what it's going to take to actually turn something into an action step. How are we going to save more money? How are we going to retain more employees? How are we going to meet our goals at the end of the year? And that is what we are going to be talking about today. So today I'm going to share with you the secrets that I've discovered working with top companies around the world to attract and retain their top millennial talent. Now, these are strategies that I have been paid top dollar for to come in and to develop these strategies. And, and I want to share them with you. Let me tell you why. Yes, at the end of the year, you always you know, focus on where did I, you know, where can I improve? What does next year want to look like for me? And one overwhelming theme that I found and that I discovered about myself last year was that the more that I gave away, the more came back to me. I think it's really easy when we have, you know, information or insider solutions to kind of keep things really close to our chest. But I've discovered not only is it incredibly fulfilling, it's also really good business practice to continue to give away your wisdom. And so that is what I want to do and why I had to our first working week here of 2017 to go full force and spill my guts about what lessons have I learned from working from these companies, particularly in 2016. But it's been a four year journey and I'm ready to jump on this conversation to give you the skills that you need. At the end, we're going to talk about this 2017 checklist that I put together for you guys. As most people were kind of relaxing and hanging out on New Year's Day, I was uh, busy working away in my little workshop putting together this list because 
I think it's really going to set the tone for each of you as you go into your companies, your organizations, or whatever uh, area you really want to conquer this next year to really get a good, clear idea, a strategy of what it's going to take to actually make it. So a few years ago, it was about a year and a half ago, my husband and I were working with an organization, a really large multinational, multi-billion dollar organization who had brought us in to their business department. Because this particular business department was um, over, overwhelmed with millennials. It was small, it was about 20 people, and we were working with the executive team, but they also had a team of millennials. Now these were millennial fellows who were coming in and they were you know, fresh out of school, and they were usually here for you know a year, maybe two years tops. However, this entire program, the fellows program, was created to identify and bring in top talent, not for one or two years, but for five or ten. So they had noticed this trend in the last two years where they were getting great talent to come in and to work for them for a year or two years, and then they would leave. So they brought us in to really figure out what's going on. I mean, where where are we missing things out here? Because they had a great culture. People were hanging out with each other. They liked being together. The top leadership was completely clueless about what it was. They thought it was, you know, something wrong with the fellows and not anything wrong with the company. And they said, can you come figure it out? What, what blind spots do we have? I'm sure many of you have had those moments when you were working with a team it's so much easier to bring someone in from the outside to say, what am I doing wrong here? Because it's too easy when you're just stuck in the middle of it just to see the problem in front of you rather than to take a different outlook and a different perspective and look inside. So that's what we were able to do. We came in and we met with the executive team in the morning. We met with the rest of the team in the afternoon. And it was incredible. They had about 10 different fellows. From meeting with the executive team, we had found this out. We didn't even know this walking in, that it was costing over $130,000 per fellow that walked out the door after a year. Now, many of you know that the average is 150% of someone's salary for them to quit within two years. But here we were seeing $120,000, $130,000 quit every few years. And it was like clockwork. For every class of seven to eight people, they'd maybe keep two. Now, can you imagine that sort of turnover in your organization? Maybe some of you are experiencing it right now, but the fact of the matter, whether you have money to burn or your uh, nonprofit pinching pennies together, no company or organization can thrive if they're looking to have that sort of turnover. So we were able to come in and we first talked to the executive team. We found out that they had thought everything was going fine. They thought that, you know, as you know, the managers, they had good relationships with the staff. They thought that everything was, was completely okay. So it was interesting to know that the executive leadership had thought in their head that they were prepared. None of them were millennials, but they thought that they knew who millennials were. They thought that they could relate well to millennials. And so they were doing things really on their own. So fast forward to the end of the day when we were able to meet with the Millennial Fellows. We ran a focus group with them and it was, it was really eye-opening because these young people had come in and many of them were completely new to having an actual, uh, an actual uh, job ever before. I see Sonia asking if this will be uh, available later. Yes, it will be. If, is, if anyone else ha is having issues, type in the chat bar as well but I'll be able to send this to you all afterwards. Thanks for checking in on that. But these individuals had come in and they had never had a job before. And so this was really their first experience at seeing what it was like to you know, dress up, wear a suit, go into the office and figure things out on their own. But what was overwhelming was a conversation that we had with a young man named Patrick. Now Patrick had sat down with us and we do this funny, silly little exercise called speed networking. And speed networking is where you sit down with an individual. They could be a superior, they could be a peer, and you ask a series of questions to get to know who the other person is. So we sat down with Patrick and we asked him, so Patrick, why are you here? Why did you decide to work at this organization and not something else? And Patrick explained to us that he had lost his grandmother to catastrophic cancer when he was 18 or 19 years old. And he had decided then and there that he was going to switch his major in school and begin to study the cure for what had killed his grandmother. 
he was so driven by his passion to find a solution that it didn't matter how much money he made. It didn't matter uh, the company that he worked for. It didn't really even matter the culture. He was so fascinated with how do you come up with a solution. He was that passionate about where he was going. Later on, we got together with the leadership team. We said, how many of you know Patrick's story? I'm sure many of you can guess that the answer was none. None of them had any experience actually asking any of their fellows what made them tick. They figured if they had a cool work environment and they were friends with their staff, that these young people wanted to stay. But the reality was, when we were talking to Patrick, we said, what would make you stay? And he really said two things. He said, I want to have the opportunity to become a better person. I want to become a more well-rounded person. And he said, secondly, I want opportunities to grow here professionally. I don't want someone to put a cap on my ability just because I'm young or because I haven't been at the company a certain amount of years. I want to have the flexibility to fly. It was interesting taking that feedback back to the leadership team who were at the very moment that we were getting together meeting in the room next door talking about whether or not they should offer a raise for this uh, for this employee. It was fascinating because this young man had said something completely opposite to what they were assuming. They were assuming they wanted more money and that they you know, wanted bean bags and free beer to be able to come and hang out. But this young man said it so clearly and I think really profoundly that he really wanted the freedom to fly. We were able to work with that organization to help them identify not only why their millennials were quitting, because we had to run surveys not only for each individual, but then really find out as a group, what did they want? So when you're asking millennials, yes, there's the individual component, but there's also the group as well. What does the group want? What does your new class of employees in 2017 want, expect, and need to thrive in this next year? Those are the types of questions that we're going to be asking in 2017. And I say we are going to, because I know together that you're going to take a completely new approach, maybe even sharpen the skills that you've had in the past to really reach and retain this new and incredible generation. Some of the things that we were able to do specifically, I, I want to share with you because I want to see you implementing them in your organization. They may sound simple, but they are so profound. And by making these very specific tweaks, this organization was able to reach and retain their millennial talent unlike ever before, where before they were losing $120,000 for every millennial who was leaving. Now they're able to not only identify millennials who were worth keeping before they even got to a position of quitting, and more importantly, when they had the great talent that they were hiring, they were able to put them in a place that they felt that they had significance. So here are some of the things that we were doing with them. Specifically, we opened up and we did what I just shared about. We did, we did surveys to find out what their individual millennials were thinking. The executive team had thought that they understood everything. They thought that they had a good relationship. But I'm sure as each of you know, you as the boss asking your millennial whether or not they're happy or fulfilled or like you as a person is very different than having someone else like us come in and provide expert surveys to understand the underlying factors and the core motivators of your team. The second thing that they were able to do was to flip their culture on its head. This was an organization that was very much top down. As friendly as they were at the top, they were still uh, a culture that said you had to earn your stripes. So although the structure itself wasn't able to be changed completely, it was a 150-year-old organization, and, and we really believe in respecting entities and cultures when we come in. But we realized that there were some really unique ways we could go about it so that these young people felt like they really did have an opportunity to feel things on their own. We created something called the Awesome Committee, where the fellows could get together, and it was uh, an environment for them to hang out, for them to do extracurricular activities, for them to plan kayaking trips or, uh, or happy hours or things that they could do together. Because what we found through those surveys was that these young people really wanted to spend more time with one another. Many of these people had moved away from home, were starting uh, a new life uh, in a place that they had never been to before. And so having a culture where they felt like that was their family at work was so incredibly important to them. Finally, we were able to provide training for their young people and their young staff. 
one of the trainings that we provide was something called uh, the Myth Bust Myth Busters, which if anyone has read my book, Five Millennial Myths, uh, it's really uh, targeted toward not only managers, but to young people to identify what core myths or stereotypes are you having to overcome to be successful uh, in the workplace where you're at now. I can tell you as someone who I'm 28 years old, right now and we speak to millennials my team we're all millennials who we go in and teach because we can say to young people hey guess what when you're on your phone if I pull up my phone right now and I start texting it looks looks like I'm you know playing Pokemon Go or you know making happy hour plans with my friends when in reality I could be you know sending an email to a colleague or following up on something so we help young people identify the stereotypes that, yes, it's not great that, you know, just because I'm young, you might assume that I'm goofing off on my phone. But we really believe that once millennials start to understand and recognize that there are stereotypes associated with us, that you can overcome those. And we throw down challenges, and it's amazing to see what overcomes from them. We also worked with their executive teams and their managers to provide training to help them self-assess where they were where yes, on the whole, they thought, yeah, we're doing really well when it comes to millennials. But the truth is that they were not asking core questions that millennials needed. They were not providing feedback, for example, in the timely fashion millennials were expecting. So we were able to put together a feedback system that prompted and uh, incentivized them to provide feedback to their young people, not only once a year or that 360 review process, but every single day. We were finding these young people were craving just a, hey, good job, or hey, work on this better, or hey, did you think about it in this way? And I've talked about this before. If you've been to any of my, my webinars, we recently did one on how do you give feedback. And we had Michael Heller on, who is uh, the founder and president of a company called iReview. And it's a really cool uh, technology. It's I call it the Facebook of feedback, where you're able to give feedback in real time. And we talked about it on a webinar just like this, about how important constant feedback is, not only to millennials, but to the modern workforce. Because we're living in a society where instant access and instant gratification is really the, the rule of the day. So why not take those expectations that your employees have for instant feedback on social media and give them instant feedback on how they're actually doing. And so he has technology to be able to do that. But there are so many opportunities technology, with technology or without technology to create a culture of feedback or you incentivize it where we would, uh, with this company we had fake little awards where we gave people for giving lots of feedback or you know for the biggest fail, right? Where working with a generation with like millennials for example who Many of us are afraid to fail, and so encouraging people to fail really big and make really big mistakes are going to show these young people that they have a place and that they have a culture that they can align in. Now, it was interesting to note that one of the key factors that the leadership told us that this company was seen for the, the main reasons, I should say, that their young people were quitting was that they were going to a different, uh, a different type of organization. They hadn't necessarily said that they don't want to work at the company, but they had kind of switched directions entirely. About 30% of their young people who were working with them decided that, you know what, this isn't for me, I need to try something else. So when that is the case, we have such a high number of young people coming in and realizing after the fact that it's not for them. You have to realize that the hiring and recruiting side needs some help as well. So identifying not only questionnaires, but letting these young people come in and take a cultural tour of the organization. We're starting to see that more and more where, where employees are able to say, well, where am I going to be eating lunch and who am I going to be hanging out with and where's my desk going to be? And those are the types of questions that you're going to start seeing more of in 2017 if you're not seeing them already. But these young people who are coming in and working for you don't just want a job but they want an experience. So what kind of experience are you prepared to give them as you move into this next year? Now we're seeing huge trends in 2017. I'm sure each of you are either experiencing or noticing in the news how millennials are quickly taking over, well, pretty much everything, right? Well, with millennials and this new workforce, I'm starting to see really three core trends that I think we're going to make a big change in 2017. The first is the role of virtual reality. 
VR is changing everything from how we experience our hotel rooms to how we shop to how, of course, we play video games. But we're going to start seeing uh, a large factor of VR in how they experience that culture I was talking about, where you're able to actually use virtual reality to introduce young people into the type of work environment that you have. Virtual reality is also going to infuse a new level of not only complexity, but also to opportunity when it comes to teleworking. When before you could just kind of work from home and stay disconnected, we're starting to see the pendulum swing back in the other direction where companies are saying, you know what, it's actually really important for, for culture and for morale, for people to be together in a workplace at the same time. Well, let's make sure that everybody's coming in the office, you know, at least two days a week. You know, those hoteling hours are really popular. But as virtual reality starts to be more commonplace, not just in technology firms, but really in industries across the board, I really think that we're going to start seeing a huge expectation of young people to use virtual reality to get their jobs done as well. The second really big trend that I'm seeing is what I call the side hustle generation. My last book, The Millennial Entrepreneur, is all about how uh, the economy is going to change based off of expectations that young people have for not only their jobs, but also to the, the how they're giving back and the entrepreneurship side of things. So we're starting to see the side hustle generation really move away from one career path for the rest of their lives. We're going to start seeing that as young people are looking for more jobs or switching jobs, that what's causing them to come and work for you is not necessarily, you know, the paycheck, but it could just be the flexibility to be able to do some of the other projects that they want to do as well. So we're not looking for a career anymore. We're looking for an experience. We're looking for something that can make us a better person. So what does this side hustle generation mean? It means more people are expecting to either be 1099s uh, or requesting that they're 1099s. Uh, and it's going to be a lot more people who are looking for more short-term contracts. Now, I'm working on a research paper right now, working with an international polling firm to figure out whether or not this is going to change the retention for young people who call themselves these side hustlers uh, or you know, these kind of hired guns who will come in and work on a specific project. And so the numbers aren't in yet, but my hypothesis is that we're going to start to discover that these young people who will come in and work on a specific project or work for a certain amount of time will consider themselves loyal if they have an opportunity to really have a brand affinity. That means that they don't feel like they're a hired gun and that they're not just here to make you money and then leave, but it's to be a part of a larger vision. Culture is, of course, really important, to it, but we're going to see many of these 1099ers come out uh, and, and be working remotely where, you know, you might not need a communications team or a marketing team, and you certainly don't need a website developer. You can, you know, completely outsource all of those opportunities. So how do you make it more than just a gig and make it more like a culture? And so I'm starting to do more research around that because I think that that's going to be the big difference between 2016 and 2017, and particularly as the economy improves, I think that we're going to see, see more people really, um, really value their mobility to be able to travel and move and experience the world at their own pace, that they're not going to have to be tethered necessarily to your company. I think the third really big trend we're going to see is we're going to see more young people quitting and starting their own companies. I see it every single day. I mentor many of them who are deciding that they want to become entrepreneurs. But it's really interesting to note there's a huge trend in corporate leadership, which I'm sure many of you know, which is intrapreneurship, which is basically how do you think like an entrepreneur at your own job? And so I believe that there's going to be a huge need for intrapreneurship training within companies to be able to retain these wanderlust talent people. Because frankly, Many people who are thinking, oh, maybe I should start a company, uh, probably shouldn't, right? And it's not your job to tell someone you're not going to start a company or that's a terrible idea or any of that. And I'm sure none of you would ever actually say that. I hope not. But the truth is that you can take that entrepreneurial drive and excitement and really target a problem within your organization. I was able to interview um, one of the participants of, um, it's basically like, like a shark tank kind of idea 
uh, incubator within HHS here in Washington, D.C., and what they were able to find was that, yes, not every single uh, project that they came up with was able to be executed on. Sometimes, you know, bureaucracy gets in the way, timeline, budget gets in the way, but they created an, an a platform for people to come together and innovate and ideate and say, hey, how do we come at this problem in a different way so that people can feel that their ideas are being heard? And so I would encourage you to think about how do you, you know, inject this entrepreneurship culture within your organization. We've already started to see that, so we're able to, to work with companies. We actually have an entire course called Entrepreneurship, teaching particularly young people, you know, first off, say I do have great ideas, does that mean that I need to, you know, put my great ideas into this company, or should I take it somewhere else, or should I partner, or should I side hustle, what should I do with them? Because too many young people in 2016 quit their jobs, had a great idea, and now are unemployed and living back with their parents because they didn't think through that just because you have a great idea and you want to innovate and ideate doesn't mean that you should be doing it on your own. So what if our organizations and companies became platforms for these entrepreneurial millennials to apply their passion to real world problems and also stay employed at the same time? So those are the three really big trends I wanted to share with you that we're going to start seeing in 2017 because we're already a week in. I feel like it's March already. I mean, this, this, this year is going to fly by even more than 2017 is. I, I know that. But I know that you're also looking at, you're putting together your budgets, you're thinking about where are we going to be in a year, you're reassessing everything, you're kind of waking up from the holiday coma and saying, all right, we need to get back at it. Where do we want to be this time next year? And what does good look like? So I'm going to go over to the little chat bar and see where we're at. So Art um, explains, as to the biggest fail, how powerful would it be if the culture allowed for boomer ex-gen leaders trained to lead out with stories that vulnerab vulnerably showed their scars and mess ups, even it happened last week. See, Art, this is why, this is why we're friends. <laughs> Art is an incredible leader and we share very much of the same heart for my generation. And Art has a great point. One of the big things that millennials want in leaders is vulnerability. You call it vulnerability, I call it authenticity and transparency, right? Where we want to know that who we're following has things that they haven't figured out yet either. And I love that you said, even if it happened last week, right? Not saying when I was your age, right? That's um, that's one of the things you should never tell a millennial. <laughs> like, well, when I was your age, this is how I figured out, or this is what I did. It's great to tell stories, but too often times it can come across as almost very patronizing. What we would love to say is, okay, cool. They still don't have it figured out. They're still in process. And if you're still in process, Art, that means I'm okay that I'm still in process too. As I was talking about before, just you know, this idea that young people don't like to fail. Well, you want to fail safely, right? Like you don't want your employees going off and you know calling your your top client and then messing up a deal or you know taking things in their own hands without without um, structure around them. That's really important. But I like to give people what we call kind of this. Um, the sandbox, right? Where you've got this little sandbox and people can play in the sandbox and they can mess things up in the sandbox. And if they fall in the sandbox, it doesn't really hurt. But when you get out of the sandbox, that's when things really matter. So what kind of projects are you going to give millennials inside of the sandbox for them to be able to play with? Oh, Maury wants to know what the three trends are. So uh, the first is, wow, I should have written them down. Okay, the last one is entrepreneurship. <laughs> How's that one? The second one is the gig economy. Uh, and the first one is uh, virtual reality. So I hope you guys all got that. Virtu virtual reality, uh, the gig economy, and um, what did I say? Now, now I'm going to test you guys. Anyway, whatever the third one is. Uh, so I know that with these three trends that you're going to entrepreneurship, thank you. See, you were, you were, you were paying attention. Uh, so those are really the three trends that we're going to see, uh, and getting ahead of it again is going to be so incredibly important. So now I want to share with you this checklist that since all of you showed up, which by the way, thank you for showing up. I know it's a crazy week. I mean, I just have been in meetings all day, just got back to my office and like plugged in my computer and I'm like, here we are, right? It's just been a crazy week. So I just really want to thank each of you guys for showing up because I know you're all really busy and doing a bunch of things and this is really important. So I really appreciate you guys making the time. But I also want to go over with you what I'm going to send each of you after this call, which is what I've kind of dubbed my millennial 
uh, retention checklist for 2017. These are the core things that you're going to need to cover in 2017 to be able to uh, really reach and retain this generation. Now I wrote them down somewhere and each of you again are going to, I'm gonna send this to you. I have a beautiful document that I'm gonna send to you as well. But I wanna share with you before we get too far into it. Uh, the first is really focusing on how are you taking the temperature of your organization? Too many leaders, and I work with top executives every single week who say, you know what, Gabrielle, we've got it. You know, we're, we're really good at this. I think, I think we've, we're, we, we've heard enough about this millennial thing, right? I mean, if I had a dollar for every single time that I heard someone be like, no, we've got this millennial thing down. I'm like, okay, why are they quitting, right? So the, the opportunity before us really is, you know, working with leadership to help them take an honest assessment of themselves to say, okay, as leadership and management, where are we at? How are we doing? So that's everything from an internal survey, like what we've done with that large company I shared with, to even doing an internal focus group. We work with organizations all the time to come in as outside voices to give them an opportunity and a platform to share what their feelings are, concerns are, and really help develop, okay, well, what are the next steps? But you must, before you do anything else, really take that core assessment because your blind spots are invisible to you, but they're very visible to everyone else, especially your millennials. So that's the first thing you absolutely have to do in the first quarter of this year. The second thing, and I'm sure each of you have heard me talk about this a ton because I'm a super fan of mentoring, but you have to develop a mentoring program. You have to. 2017 is your year to develop a mentoring program. And if you have one that's currently in place, uh, odds are it's probably not as effective as it needs to be. I'm just going to be honest with you. Most companies say that they have a mentoring program, but they suck. They're just not effective because they're, I call it the, the blind dating of mentoring, right? Where it's like mentor A and mentor B somehow are supposed to meet up and be mentor happy. And that's just not how people are. We're, we're very organic. We're very relational driven. And we want to know that it's a good match. So this is the year that you are going to develop an organic and authentic mentoring program. You are going to create opportunities for young people and those with more experience at your company to have authentic conversations and relationships. And that doesn't just mean developing a, a formalized mentoring program, because I know you're already thinking, Gabrielle, I've got so many other things on my mind. You're giving me tons of homework. Mentoring is a culture more than it is a program. So work on developing a mentorship culture where reverse mentorship, where people who are young are providing feedback to the top, is also on the line. Mentoring, if you don't have it, it's a core um, foundation for any sort of retention strategy because not only are you investing in your next generation talent, that you are transferring knowledge and wisdom from one generation to the other, but you're also doing something that millennials love, and that's you're creating an opportunity for them to learn and become better people, which is really important. Millennials love that training and development component. Uh, the third is to reassess your onboarding program. You have an onboarding program now, and it's been in place for years, most likely, and it hasn't been touched. Uh, since you put it together, but millennials are coming in and we're finding a huge turnover between millennials saying yes to the job and actually starting that job. There's a huge amount of young people who, as soon as you tell them, congratulations, we'd like to make you an offer. They're already on LinkedIn or they're talking to their friends or, you know, they're looking at their other opportunities and shopping that offer around. Now, you cannot afford to lose great talent that you've already decided, yes, they're going to be great cultural fit. You've already spent so much time interviewing them. The spot is going to be filled and you're, you could lose them because you didn't make a personal connection with them. Because as we all know, millennials are interviewing you as much as you are interviewing them. So creating an onboarding program that starts as soon as they get the acceptance le letter that gets them into the culture and gets them excited about it. Working with a really cool organization called Enborder, who does just that. It's technology that essentially connects the culture of the organization to the new hire. The minute they become, uh, they they accept uh, the offer letter and they start to their journey on looking at, okay, well, what does this actually mean? It's a really cool, really cool organization. So if you're interested in that or I review, as I talked about before, I'd love to be able to connect to really cool guys who run those corporations. So what you've got to do with an onboarding process is really a few things. Onboarding is more than, you know, just making sure that they understand their health benefits. 
it's everything from, you know, what are the do's and don'ts of our company? What's, you know, the dress code, if there is one? Uh, what do we do here, you know, on Fridays? What are the cultural nuances? Because one of the big things that, you know, anybody, it doesn't matter how old you are, it's really nerve wracking walking into a new job and not knowing what the culture is like. Millennials, again, want to know that they've got a family with them. So if you're able to identify, hey, okay, guess what? I've been in your position plenty of times. I'm sure you've got lots of questions. I want to let you know that I'm here for you. Create those relationships as soon as you can and create an onboarding program that isn't just, hey, here's the do's and don'ts of the job, but hey, welcome to the culture. We are so excited that you're here. That's going to be the defining factor because employees, no matter their age, decide how long they're going to stay at a company within the first six weeks. Within the first six weeks of them working for you, they're going to decide whether they're going to stay there for two years or 10 years. So think about how you're creating an experience for them within those first six weeks that makes them you know, decide, okay, you know, I'm not going to be looking on LinkedIn anymore and I've decided full tilt, I'm going to be here long term. The fourth is really to focus on leadership development and leadership training for young people. As I talked about before, millennials want to know that you're investing in them to make them better people, not just better employees. And so that means having a leadership training uh, tool for them, not just when you have them there for two years. Many of our clients will say, okay, well, Gabrielle, I mean, we put them, we, we can't afford to train everybody to be a leader because not everybody's a leader, right? Not like everybody's a winner, right? But the reality is that everybody has leadership potential and leadership capabilities inside of them. And when you're telling these young people, hey, we've got a leadership or a management or an excellence training course, whatever you want to call it, you're saying, I care about you as a person. You're not promising that they're going to be you know, senior vice president in the next five years, but you are saying you have the capabilities within you and the capacity to do something great. And I want to invest in that to grow you into who you are. So what sort of leadership development training do you have for millennials? It could be everything from, you know, training development on soft skills, like uh, time management, managing up, uh, conflict resolution, which we do all of those, or it could be something more extensive where you're actually taking them and you're connecting them with a mentor or you're giving them special projects. But think in 2017 how you can take your leadership development training of your millennials to the next level. The next is to focus on training your executive leadership team. This is one of the things that we, uh, we focus on so much, where it's probably once a week I'm giving an executive brief, I'll be honest with you, where I'm working with the leadership team at the top to help them re-rack their brain to figure out how are they reaching the next generation, not only from the hiring side, but also too from the marketing side. As millennials are now 2017, millennials are now the largest consumer market on the planet. So how are you reaching millennials is so incredibly important. So working with leadership team, how are you preparing them? Are you giving them briefs? Um, are you having someone like us come in and provide a presentation on who millennials are and how we think through our strategy for this next year? Because it can't just be, oh yeah, we've been there, done that. We've, we've had someone come in and talk about multi-generational blah, 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 or whatever. This is really the year that it's going to make the big difference. Because by 2020, millennials are going to be the ones ruling the world. And we've got three more years to really prepare for what this big change is going to have. And leadership at the top needs to have a better framework to not be afraid of who millennials are, but to really get excited about what those opportunities look like and start thinking legacy planning, right, is how do I want to be investing in this next generation to make sure that they're, they're fulfilling the legacy of our organization as well. The next thing that we need to be doing is uh, encouraging extracurricular uh, fun. Millennials love hanging out with their friends at work. They want to feel like they've got more friends at work and family at work than they do in their own community. So how are you encouraging that F factor, right? That fun factor in the office. So whether that's, you know, pancake breakfast on Fridays or, you know, uh, group camping trips or whatever you want it to be, throw it back on them. Don't Put any more work on your plate that you have to, right? Ask millennials to come up with something and run it and better yet fund it for them. So think of the fun things that you can be doing this next year. I really want you to focus on how are you giving back? What sort of philanthropic goals do you have? Most organizations give back, uh, usually towards the end of the year because tax write-offs are nice. 
Uh, but the reality is that millennials who are working for organizations who have standard um, groups that they give to aren't necessarily feeling personally connected not only to the cause but also to the company because, and I'm sure you can figure this out, millennials want to know that they have a personal commitment to the charity philanthropy that you're giving to. So crowdsource where you're giving to every year or ask their opinion or, or say, hey, where do you guys want to go and volunteer You know, in February or March? So make it something that they feel personally connected to rather than sending out an email at the end of the year and say, hey, we just pledged $10,000 to XYZ charity. Make them feel like they're a part of it. One of the big things that we're gonna see in 2017 is, and it's a project that I'm working on, I'm actually really excited about, can't talk about it yet, but I'm very excited about, is essentially to help leaders pay off student debt for their employees. How are you incentivizing these young people, whether it's you know student debt counselors, if you're not set up in a way that you can actually pay it off, or to do what many of our, of our clients are doing is to focus on taking 401k money and diverting it towards paying off student debt. As you know, <coughs> excuse me, the average millennial is $28,000 in student debt. The US government, many of the departments, if you worked there for at least 10 years, you can get for, forgiven of your student debt. There are systems out there, there are already some companies like PwC who are doing this. So how are you thinking about taking that money you would be putting towards their 401k or another um, retirement savings fund and giving it towards young people to pay off this debt that is literally crippling them? And frankly, it's hurting our economy as well. And the final thing is to work on a feedback system. I talked about things like iReview, which are really great resources, but how are you giving feedback and how are you incentivizing feedback within your organization so that people across the board can really focus on, on getting the information they need to become the best asset to your company possible. That's all feedback is, is it's not a pat on the back. It's not, hey, stop doing that. You're doing a terrible job. It's becoming a more honed tool to create the most amount of value possible to become this like ninja of value in the organization. And that's how you have to talk about it is it's an incredible opportunity. It's not something that you have to check off your list every single week. All right, I'm gonna jump into the message bar because I just like black out when I'm talking. Uh, Dan said, hey Dan, um, is there an ideal mentor? Uh, one, I was gonna say no, but there definitely is. Not age, uh, person, personality type or anything like that. I think that the ideal mentor is someone who wants to be there. I think many mentors, and we've seen this in mentoring programs we've put together for companies where people raise their hand and say, I wanna be a mentor and yet they show up and it's pretty clear that they don't want to be or they're not prepared so it's so important to train people before they say that they want to be a mentor in how to be a mentor or how to be a mentee so that expectations are set from the beginning and that way you're not coming into a mentoring relationship saying well i thought we were supposed to hang out every tuesday at 9 a.m dan and you know apparently you know you only want to talk to me once a week or once a month Right, so you're helping set expectations. So I think the best mentor is the one who wants to be there and one who's actually prepared or trained. Art's talking a lot. I know Art is really passionate about mentoring. Everyone talks about a mentoring program, but mentoring means something different to many people. Very true. Uh, and in many cases, a mysterious black box. I don't think a mentoring program will ever get its and keep its legs unless it has clear definitions, competencies, boundaries, roles, responsibilities, metrics. Oh yeah, could not agree more. I mean, you have to, mentoring does mean different things for different people. Uh, I, I like taking the approach of a mentor as more of a coach, and our studies have actually proven that the millennials say they wanna be mentored, but really what they want is to be coached. They like the term coaching a lot more than they even like the word mentoring. And you know, the difference is a coach is as someone, I played competitive tennis for 15 years and I coached for five years after that. And I had the best relationship with my guys and my girls, because as the coach, I was hard on them. I made them run laps. I made them push themselves skill wise, but I was also, you know, taking them to go get tacos after practice, right? So it's the ability to be hard and then also to be able to, to be a friend and come, do life with them. And I think that's a big difference of what a coach is. Well, a mentor is going to give you advice and kind of back away and kind of give you more of like a uh, 13,000 level um, view on the situation, a coach is really gonna be doing things with you, which I think, um, which is, 
I think really key. So Jamie says the fun stuff is hard in the government sector. Couldn't agree more. I, uh, I worked in the government for four years and it is difficult because the culture is set by those who are in leadership currently. But I wanna challenge you because it's, it's difficult but it's not impossible and tell you why. Working in the government sector, uh, it was hard for me to find a community of people who uh, I felt like had the same values of me as me and, and everyone was very mission driven, which I appreciate in the government. Everyone is there for a reason, right? But how do you take that and, and take that kind of idea of mission and turn it towards something fun? So it could be, you know, volunteering for, say, Habitat for Humanity, right, which is not only mission-driven, but it gives you an opportunity to do things together, and it's outside and outside of the office, right? So think through creatively. And for you, I'd love to see you do an internal survey, just ask around to see what kind of interactive fun things do you want to do. Maybe it's after work or maybe it's during lunchtime. I know with a lot of government employees, like, as soon as it's like, all right, it's 5 o'clock, let's go home, right? We're like, I've been here all day. I don't want to hang out with my coworkers anymore, which is ironic because we see that with a lot with Xers and boomers. And uh, they're like, why would I want to hang out with my coworkers after work? And millennials are like, what do you mean you don't want to hang out with me, right? So think through, you know, what people's needs are and expectations. But the fun side of things, it's really, um, I think, giving liberation for people to be able to have freedom, to have fun. And that way they're not feeling like they're, they're in trouble all along the way. Uh, thank you, Mick, for showing up. I, I super respect Mick, so I'm really glad that he jumped on. He said, I appreciate your knowledge is based on experience and sound research. I said, that's why it's so practical. So Mick um, just uh, endorsed my second edition of my book. Uh, Mick Clay is the author of multiple books, um, but most recently his second edition of Managing the Millennials, uh, which I'm really honored that he had me write the foreword to, so everybody should go out and get a copy immediately on Amazon. Uh, but what I did mention before in the email to some of you uh, was that my new book, Five Millennial Myths, is coming out with a second edition, and we just sent it to the printer. And uh, the new edition has a whole new chapter on parenting, because I got so many questions about parenting. And it's uh, rewritten from a lot of this experience I'm talking about, is how do you practically do it? Because before I wrote it more from um, my personal experience, and now having started this international training company, I worked with companies around the world, and so I'm able to inject a lot of real world experience and hey, this is what we did for this company, and this is how it worked. And so for all showing up tonight, I'm gonna be sending you, yes, more, it's managing, managing the millennials. Uh, I'm gonna be sending each of you a link uh, to get a free copy of the book when it comes out, because I am just that thankful that you guys were able to able to come. So I'm going to open it up for questions and answers at this point. So if you have any questions, I know I've been answering a lot of your questions throughout, but feel free to type into uh, the message section on the side, to see if you have any questions that I can help answer here. One of the questions I was asking you was, what was your biggest challenge with millennials in 2016? And Janet said, letting them be themselves, but also asking them to be what's considered professional in my organization. I mean, not laughing through your presentation to the staff, right? It's, um, that's interesting. That's a really, that's a very, uh, I'm, I was going to say common um, challenge that we're seeing is this, um, the professionalism of this generation, which is, again, a huge reason that I've seen many young people needing uh, soft skills training, where many of the managers I work with, one of their top frustrations is, you know, I feel like I have to babysit them, or I have to, you know, make decisions for them, or they have a, need a lot of, you know, quote unquote, hand holding, which we see a lot of. And that's really where that coaching opportunity comes is, you know, helping them un understand the culture and expectation of what, <coughs> excuse me, professionalism means in your organization, but going even further than that and helping them learn things on their own as well and saying, hey, you know, I, I want to make sure that you are the best fit here and that you shine like the rock star that you really are. So I want to help you tweak some of these things that others perceive as unprofessional, but you really just see as part of your personality. So I really want to help, um, help you see that. Yeah, great point, Janet. Or it could be a, a, a new version of professional. I mean, there's certainly a, a new 
uh, a new definition of business casual, right? I went into an office not long ago, and they're like, we're business casual here. I'm like, that guy's wearing moccasins. That is not business casual, right? Like, that's Cherokee casual. Like, everybody is just, we have this new idea that you can kind of just wear whatever you want uh, in the office, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think, uh, I think that uh, as we look at what professionalism means, many millennials think I'm professional because the work that I deliver to you is professional, right? So if I do it in yoga pants, does not matter? But there's something to be said at, you know, what does it mean to have a work culture that people actually prepare themselves for? So culture is something that you create yourself. You can't go in and say, this is the ideal work culture for everybody, you know, so, you know, you have to, you have to abide by it or else or, or get out. Uh, work culture is really something that people have to have buy-in and they help create. And so I, I think professional, the idea of professionalism is, is, um, is naturally growing and, and is going to be evolving as well. Uh, and that's okay. But as long as it's in line and in agreement with those who are in that culture, then you're not going to see pushback as well. So we are jumping up unless anyone else has any other questions about at our time here, but I wanted to give you guys a unique opportunity. I've never uh, done this before, but we're taking a new approach here within the millennial solution and we're only taking on 20 clients in 2017, which it's crazy. We had twice that last year, but we're working on another another project, and so we're limiting it. So what we've decided to do is um, to look at who we want to work with in 2017. And so if you're interested, I'm going to send an email out to everybody with a form. And if you think there's any way that you'd like to work with us, whether it's you know something really small, uh, like just getting on the phone and talking about something or something much larger, like having us come in and do an executive brief or a series of trainings or development training programs for you, uh, this is just an opportunity for us to start that conversation to make sure that if that's something that you think would benefit you and your organization, you have the opportunity to take advantage of. So I'm going to be sending that email out to everybody who attended here, uh, and you can go ahead and respond at your leisure. Also, too, uh, I'm going to be sending out the checklist of everything that we talked about today so that you can you know, print it off, share it uh, abundantly to everyone that you know, uh, because, again, 2017 is the year, at least for me, uh, 2017, um, my year, my word is give. So I'm really excited about giving, um, about multiplication of what can happen, and of the really cool stories of hearing from each of you about how you're implementing what we're talking about today to reach and grow with millennials. So thank you guys so much for again, taking this time out of your day. And I cannot wait to hear from you all again soon. Have a good one.